period of, um, I suppose, silence from the public's point of view. A new collection of Mary Manus was published um, within the last couple of months. And I suppose the first thing that caught me about it was the title of it, Valparaiso, for lots of reasons. Um, I have the privilege and pleasure every morning of coming down to the Fork Road on my way to work. And anytime I see a ship in the bay, which is quite often the old White the Broom poem, immediately jumps to my body, oh, long ago, Valparaiso. And I was delighted that this that this this was selected and also that she that she kind of in the acknowledgments almost she um she refers to the gives the first two verses of the poem, but then I think what she says in her own sweet way was Mary, this is in her English version, she says, Go, she says, on your long journey away from misery, rain and cold. Below the below the nice life slash of the end, this is a shining city shaded jewels. Quite the rune as the poet did not, in fact, make the journey and regret it for the rest of his life. Mary O'Malley does, and she shares that journey with us very generously indeed, in a stunning connection. And I think the, the actual beginning poem is a symbol of us to follow, and I think it's a rather beautiful thing called Poem and a Leaf for Kevin. Be life aimed, be strong as winter, be the sun's dance on every water. That's the nice part. Then we get the journey. And here to share that journey with us and to chat a little bit about our collection is Mary O'Malley. Mary, thanks so much for talking to me for a few moments Thank you this very collection. Much for me. It's a stunning collection. Thank you. No, it really is. But I can imagine that your heart, soul, and blood went into it for lots of reasons. It was, there was, you mentioned that there was a long period between, I think it was five years between yeah. this and the last book. And that was because I felt I had to hold the line. Yeah, a lot of mm -hmm. um, I mean, you know, you can say that about any book, but in this case, it was an artistic line being held as well. Anyway, okay. it's there now. So. It's there now. But the journey you take us on, I mean, you, in, in the first poem after the one I read, you warn all of the pitfalls. You, 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 you say, look, this is, this is going to be no easy voyage. Mm. Uh, this is a voyage without maps. This is a voyage without a compass. And we have nowhere known where we're going, either from a physical or, indeed, a mental point of view. Mm. And that's a theme that you continue right through, right through this collection. You can only go by going. You can only go, exactly, but you never know where you're going. And indeed, the other beautiful thing about it, from my point of view, is, is the fluidity of the fact that you kept on changing course as you went, went on the journey. Yeah. Until, until you actually got on the ship. Everything's fine on the ship. Everything's fine on the ship. <laughs> and that particular poem, where you, where you woke up in the morning and you discovered the first element of seasickness, if you was gone, the first element indeed of the loneliness of leaving Galway Bay was gone and you found yourself in this world. Could you describe that to me? Um, physically, what happened was I went on a voyage on the Celtic Explorer. I was invited by the, the John Joyce, actually, from the Department of the Marine. And um, I jumped at the chance because I long wanted to go on a research ship. Okay. thought I'd never get the chance. And anyway, we, we went out the bay and just the sheer physical ease of those ships is extraordinary. I mean, I'm used to the sea, but right. um, it, this is like being, it's not like, a, it's a floating laboratory, actually. Mm -hmm. um, but the smoothness with which we left the docks, the physical manoeuvring is amazing. And uh, I woke up and there we were passing the blast pit, that, that, passing the cliffs and over, mm -hmm. and then down along. Well, passing by the blast pits just physically at dawn, was the most extraordinary thing. They, it's I don't know what you call that thing where you're making a cartoon where you have all these drawings flipping by and you see the different the, the way they line up, almost like a very mm. slow film. Right. But for me, it was the first time in many years that I felt entirely safe, mm -hmm. entirely at ease. I had been living on my own for some years and I wasn't used to it. Right. So suddenly. I wasn't responsible. Other people were responsible for the ship, and they were more than capable of the job. Right, okay. You know, the other curious element in this, and this this came of a recent book that I all a book book that I also reviewed was um, Paul, um, Paul Durkin's book, The Parisian Element. Yes. How a lot of Paris. It, the two thirds of this book was actually written in Paris. Right. Now it might have been all notated in Paris, but the reading underneath it, and there's obviously an awful lot of reading yeah. going on underneath yeah. it. Um, most, most of that took place. Courtesy of the Arts Council and the Irish College in Paris, the yeah, Science as, as Academy, thought, yeah. which is enormously important. I cannot even begin to say how important that vision was. I needed to be out of Ireland, to be looking back at Ireland, mm -hmm. to get as far as I needed to go in these points. Yeah. And the 
it's like a safe house of house, the Irish College. It's the best way I can describe it. But it physically takes you away so that you can have conversations we just weren't having now. Right, yeah. I'm not going to go into why we weren't having them, but we weren't having them. Was this with your compatriots or yeah. was this with other people? With other people it was wonderful because yeah. I could have conversations. I do have quite a few friends in Paris. Yeah, yeah. But the, the most interesting aspect I found was that the Irish artists in Paris have a sort of conversation that it's very hard to have at home. Yeah. Now several people agreed with me on that. Mm -hmm. I think the Irish College in Paris is a fantastic resource for, for many of us. Mm. And that also places you right in the sort of exile, well, I don't want to romanticise this, but it places you, you I suddenly realised why Beckett left, why Joyce left, mm -hmm. why they had to go uh, in order to see things in a certain way. Mm. And certainly for me, I have to go in order to look back, right. or indeed to look out. Mm -hmm. After all, Ireland was falling apart. It hadn't fallen apart when I started writing this yeah. ostensibly. Yeah. But by the time I published it, it had fairly done so. And in fact, some of the anger, uh, <laughs> if, if anger is the word to use, appears in it. In one particularly one, which I, I just can't find here at the moment, uh, where you kind of talk about the whole idea of the church and the, um, the, church and the whole idea that the... Um, world didn't exactly center around the church the way the church would have us believe yeah uh, which i thought was a brilliant poem uh, about the roman. yes the roman one is it yeah. um, um which i rather liked in the, no, it's not well uh i do yes mercy we got our christianity from egypt yes. not yes. rome but the pope won so all the convent girls sing oh 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 de bella, bella gal, gal. Mm. I always thought it was so crazy <laughs> that all these girls in their gym slips out in Clifton or mm. anywhere in the country are singing about the Punic Wars. <laughs> well, I used or to love the fact that actually brought back to mind my I, um, my own Latin teacher, who was a lovely, lovely man called Father O'Reilly, a Jesuit. Now he was he was a genuine, a beautiful man, a spiritual man. Yeah. But every night, every evening, when we walked out after playing a game or hurrying our football from the school, he'd be at the gate of school. Remember your senior. Remember your sister. Yeah. Which, of course, we probably forgot. Yeah. That's another story. Yeah. No, there's one other I had a wonderful Latin teacher, and oh. I love Latin music. Like this. Uh, Maybe in stress in Ireland, you might have been thinking of that as well, which is that was my one flash. That was the one with the Ryan. That was the Ryan. Yeah, that was the Ryan with the church. Yeah. I'm not particularly angry with most. I'm yeah. angry with the state. The one also I think I'd like you to read, which is on page 51, um, because we did mention it in our preamble into this, and it brought a certain. Um, Shall we say, focus for yourself, as you said earlier on. Mm. If you would like to read that, play it again, Sam. Play it again, Sam. There's a painting in a gallery in Berlin of two men looking at the moon. A third man stood in front of it for a long time before penning the words, Oi Ben Mo, an Irishman enchanted by endurance. If life had to go on and mm. on and again on, he found it more tolerable in France than Dublin, but English resisted him, so he wrote every play twice. At least. Good old Beckett, <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, the, the other curious because element... Because there's a the linguistic split, of course, always going on in my work. Yeah, it? well, that, I think I think that, <laughs> that, that would go normally, yeah. well, yeah, by the, the bicultural Irish language and... Yes. Yeah, yeah. The, the other thing that, that I found in it, though, and uh, mm -hmm. it surprised me a little bit, um, I, I've come to the belief, as I was saying to you earlier, that in most poetry collections now that there is a hidden narration going on mm -hmm. between the poet and the poet himself or herself and the reader, or indeed just the book or the poetry itself. Mm -hmm. It's a very fluid thing. But in your instance, I found that one way that you, you, you kind of walked your way through this journey was this inherent, quietly there, but there nonetheless, satire that was going on in your mind. And it brought to mind, to me personally, a kind of a Gulliver's Travels in one way, a Voltaire's Condé's Voyage, and a whole idea of the 18th century Enlightenment, the satire that, that informed that Enlightenment that brought it on to the revolution that happened at the end of that century. And this I found particularly in your last book in the collection, and I'd be very, very pleased if I delighted you could read that. Nearly, never merely one, I would I'll be happy to read that. I'll just say on that that the, the poems, the just to go back to what you mentioned about Valparaiso, I had to go right down to what I really believed in, a, in a, talking to Hartnett, that uh, what I believe poetry be, to be as opposed to prose. Mm -hmm. And of course, that brought me back to the vision ship and the vision poem and the vision song. 
And so you have to I make sure you're on your way. Well, I wasn't actually thinking of that at <laughs> all, in fact, <laughs> believe it or not. Yeah, right. But but just the vision ship, and I'd realised that that poem, Valparaiso, had informed my life in a way I had never realised before. And it was a choosing, really, as well, of, 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 to, of that, to follow that vision, and how vital it had been to me. Mm. Um, as a way out of what was going on perhaps in the country at the time. But anyway, Never Merely One Albertine is my version of quantum mechanics. Right, okay. Uh, according to quantum mechanics, when a particle is faced with alternatives, it does nothing until we, human, look at it. Then it either chose, chooses or it splits into multiple versions of itself whose worlds do not interact. Our identical counterparts see a different version of reality. But another way, there is no road not taken, and this makes us gods in many words, really. Science is rigorous, they say, and there is, unsurprisingly, argument. Yet all agree this surprising explanation fits the facts. There is never merely one Albertine. So long as love has her in its power, Never only one soul, one Madeline, so the quantum effect, despite our knees, stays, leaving us to weave eternally through the universes we create, cold as theorems, hot as suns. It separates us from our doubles, who do not know us, as they lie with men we did not marry, rare the child they did not abort. <laughs> 